Um, so my, my journey in um, criminal justice started when I was a young child, about seven or eight, and my mom uh, worked in, in the probation department in Lawrence, Mass. Um, she worked as a probation clerk, um, collecting fines and stuff from probationers. Um, after school, during school vacation, I used to visit her, uh, spend time with the court officers, spend time with probation officers. So, so growing up in Lawrence, Mass, I, I learned to appreciate um, the work that was being done by a lot of, um, a, a lot of our um, officials from the criminal justice system. But one thing that I saw was a power dynamic. Um, there was a power dynamic between the poor um, and the people that were actually doing the work, right? In Lawrence, over 60% of the population, especially at that time, was, were born outside of the country. Um, on top of that, it was one of the poorest cities in the state. Um, so then what we saw was, or at least what I saw as a young child, was this population that didn't have a lot of political or social or economic power being governed um, and being prosecuted by a system that has historically has, <coughs> excuse me, historically has been um, designed to, to prosecute the poor, the vulnerable, um, and the ones with the less power, right? With, with my education and with time, I came to think about this, this concept of critical values, right? Critical value with a big C. Um, and when we think about critical value, or at least critical, is what I'm, th what I'm talking about is the power dynamic between the people that have and the people that don't have, and the knowledge, um, how, how the knowledge get processed between those two groups, right? So if you're, if you're poor, if you're a minority, um, and you're a first generation student in this country, you have less access to information about how to get through the system and how to advocate for yourself and whatnot, right? And the second half of, of that phrase, critical value, is the value part is how, how do you connect emotionally to that gap, right? So when you say you want to help people as a police officer, as a probation officer, as a social worker, what is it about the values, your belief, and your norms that drives you to do your work, right? So in essence, unlocking critical value is talking about how do we explore the, 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 the power dynamic that exists in our country and combine that with the, with the values, the norms, and the beliefs um, that drove us to do that work. So to start, we first have to kind of define what criminal justice is, right? A lot of people think about policing and whatnot, but it also includes the prosecution part, the sentences part. So you get like these three C's of criminal justice, um, crime, courts, and correction. So for today, um, I'm really going to focus on the education piece, right? Criminal justice as, as a study, as an education, and how can it impact um, the students' critical values? How, 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 how do we better prepare students to go, go out there in the field um, understanding that there's a power dynamic between you as a police officer, um, as a probation officer, as a lawyer, and the people that, you, that, that you're either working with, um, arresting, prosecuting. To first get a, um, a glimpse of criminal justice, we'll do a brief history. Um, bef before the 1960s, a lot, of, um, a lot of the law enforcement was coming out of law enforcement training, um, small vocational schools. It was a lot localized, um, where local governments kind of decided how they want to train their, um, their law enforcement officers, right? So in the 1960s, um, when a, a lot of um, policy discourse on, on anti-poverty laws and policy started with LBJ's Crime Commission, um, and they did a sweep of, of courts and law enforcement and whatnot, and that was the, kind of the beginning of what we see today as criminal justice education. It continued to evolve with the, Rickson, um, with the Nixon administration and the war on crime, the war on drugs, tougher law sent, um, t sentences laws were, were, were enacted, and then that transitioned into the Ronald Reagan era uh, with the crack epidemic. Um, and again, the, the, the policing of, of, of urban spaces, of black bodies, brown bodies, to the Clinton administration where we started to see, when you started to see a transition between the military equipment kind of going into these um, local police departments. It's also the rise of mass incarceration um, with the privatization of, of jails. So with, with, with this timeline, you're able to see kind of how uh, it started at the local level and slowly became kind of like the, this natural federal kind of movement to try to centralize criminal justice. Who are the students actually going to classrooms, sitting there, hoping to, to also become either police officer or probation officer? And a lot of these students are working class, 
um, blue collar, right? It's, it's a tough job. Um, they attend public colleges. And we also see in the, in the last 20, 30 years an increase of racial and ethnic minorities um, along with women. And we also see kind of this banking model of learning, right? So when you, when you look in the classroom, it's similar to the way that we're sitting now where it's dependent on lectures and whatnot. And it's interesting, right, because these are people that, that signed up to work with people, but yet all you really do is just kind of listen and take notes and write papers with the instructor in front of you. And it's not real conversation with, with your neighbors and your, and your colleagues. Um, a lot of the students also have a legacy of public service. Um, so they, they're interested in public service because either their parents or their siblings are also in public service, kind of runs in the family. Um, most students don't sign up to kind of uphold like white supremacy, right? They, they, they do it so they could help others. Um, they're, they're motivated by, by their need to help. Um, and, mo and a lot of students also are, into, are hoping to get into law enforcement, right? I think it's over 50% over of criminal justice students hope to get into law enforcement. The problem tends to be that we have a limited perspective of what's actually the picture of criminal justice, right, and what it looks like on the ground. Um, in the classroom, we have this, this curriculum that kind of focuses on administrative pieces, on police and court procedures, as well as indiv individualized ethics, right? And what I mean by that is uh, when I was studying criminal justice, um, our ethics class tended to be about, about that one bad apple, and, and, and how not to be like that person. And it wasn't about what the, what the system or what the, what the kind of like that blue line brotherhood, right? Like you don't, you don't, you don't tattletale on your fellow officer and, and how systemically that's upheld in, in departments, right? So it kept it real individualized and that's, that's kind of what we tend to do when, when we talk about um, power and identity. We tend to say, well, you know, I'm not a racist, so it shouldn't be a problem. We, we fail to kind of zoom out and look at the larger issue. So what I'm suggesting is in order to kind of fill that, that void, um, I think liberal education could, could provide that void given the, the certain aspect that it has, particularly the way that it centers the learner in the classroom. But I'll get, I'll get more into that. Just a brief history of um, liberal education. Um, it kind of started with kind of the elitist era. Um, if you think about kind of Wellesleyan and Smith um, and those small liberal arts colleges. Kind of started there, um, obviously we could see the, the limitation with that, right? Um, with access, not everybody has access to that type of education. And then with consumerism era, we have this college student with, with a bunch of um, degrees. And then what that did with liberal education was it, it drove a higher ed into more of a vocation setting, right? How do we, how do we fill the void in, in the workforce, right? So it turned into kind of like a black and white education, more, more transactional, you, you, you pay tuition, you show up to class, you get a degree. With time, it, it really, this is more recent, um, it turned into more of a social justice um, kind of component. How can we kind of deconstruct the classroom um, from the, the standard um, banking model and actually use our identity and what we bring to the table as a way to kind of make sense of, of the discipline, in this case, criminal justice. So the main facets that I'll, I'll focus on is um, student-centered, self-awareness, and critical consciousness. So student-centered is more of an instructional piece of it. So it's about, again, it's, it's self-explanatory. It's about putting the, the student in the center of the problem and, and working with their critical um, thinking skills as well as, as the knowledge that they bring to the table as a, as a starting point to make sense of new concepts. This kind of trickles into a kind of self-awareness piece, right? Understanding um, what you bring to the table, but, but where that came from, right? The, so, the socialization that, that came with making sense of, of your job, right? If anybody remember cops, um, a lot of time all we saw was um, either black or brown men being tackled by cops or that was more frequent with just poor people being tackled by cops, right? So what does that do to your job when you want to be a cop but yet everything that you see on TV tends to pin you against the people that, you, that you're hoping to serve, right? So that self-awareness piece where you're no longer um, just trying to do your job, you're trying to understand how you do the job, right? So then that trickles into kind of this critical consciousness piece where you're no longer looking at yourself, but now you're connecting with the bigger picture and you're looking at politics, you're looking at laws, how laws are created, policymakers, how money uh, is involved, economics, 
um, who has power to, to, to knowledge and to access and, and, and the way of knowing, as well as um, how identity impacts, right? How do groups of people um, become aware and mobilize of any injustices um, and actually, you know, and, and make a difference? And it seems like a lot, but we, we make these decisions all the time. So this, this might seem kind of like, oh, man, you gonna do this in the classroom? And my answer is yes. I mean, this is, this is what you do, especially if you are part of an institution, the only institution that has power to take your freedom away, right? Like, I could legitimate just, sh like, use my firearm, shoot you, and find a way to kind of justify that, right? For more of a reason, um, for that reason alone, it should be, we should be positioning ourselves to kind of make sense of, of, of the different elements of society that, that, that comes into play during those, those decisions. I was a police officer right out of um, college um, up in New Hampshire uh, for two years, and I spent three years, three and a half years as a social worker as well. Um, one of the, one of the eye-opening, um, talking about catalysts, one of the eye-opening experience that I had as a social worker was when I had to testify against a mom uh, who I was working with, saying, pretty much testifying, saying like, I think her drug problem is too much of an issue and I don't think that child should go back home. The worst part was when I got off the stands was that I was still required to work with that mom, right? So how do you come off the stands after you tell somebody, I don't think you, you, your, um, your child should go home. Oh, by the way, are you gonna go to like NA and AA and, and, and how often are you going? Oh, can I do a home visit, right? That power dynamic was, was huge, right? I mean, I, mean I, I pretty much have her in my hands, right? And in these classes, a lot of education, a lot of training doesn't even focus on like that self-awareness and that power dynamic, that critical consciousness. So this isn't necessarily anything new per se. Um, critical criminology is something that exists in the criminal justice studies, but is 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 extremely understudied and is not even uh, really part of um, the curriculum anymore. Um, referring to the to the timeline, as 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 liberal education became less of a less of a thing in the in, in higher ed. Um, you saw criminal justice kind of pulling away from sociology, from political science, and it turned into more of a, a vocation just for criminal justice, right? It, it took away the subjectivity away from it um, and kind of turned it into like a black and white, like this is what we do, this is, this is your job, this is how the system works. Um, one way that we see, um, I, I want to show critical criminologists through the war on drugs. And, and the reason why I, I refer to um, presidential administration, because that's part of critical, critical criminology, right? You, uh, you, have to under, you have to name the people that actually write these things into law or, or whatnot, right? So during the Clinton era, um, especially, and, and especially during the Clinton era and, and started with the Reagan era, right? The concept was if we knock doors down and we get rid of drug dealers, there will be no more drugs. And I'm not an economist, but it doesn't, you know, cutting the supply doesn't seem to stop the demand, right? And that's what it was. It was, it was just knocking on doors, right? Kids being traumatized by SWAT teams coming in. Any type of criticism of the justice system, of cops, makes you a cop hater, right? Right? My mom's husband is a cop, right? Been a cop for 35 years. Um, I did police work myself, right? The, the, the least thing that we are, the people that actually stand up here and criticize it, it's actually, it's the opposite, right? We don't hate cops, it's, it's the opposite. We, we, we love the criminal justice system so much that we're willing to sacrifice our, our, our friends and whatnot to say, I don't, think that's, I don't think that's the right way to do it. But it takes time, right? So, so once, you start, once you start taking into this like, war on drugs and the politics and state violence, you start filling up these gaps. Another um, area of study that, 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 could, that could help um, criminal justice in, in terms of being more critical is how we think about victims. Crime is not a crime without a victim, and yet less than 10% of, of courses revolve around victims, right? We don't even, we don't even talk about it. I didn't take one victim class. Uh, we, don't, we don't talk about it in the police academy. It was never a thing in the police academy, how to, how to abstract information from victims of crime. Again, you start filling up the gaps when you start talking like this, right? You start talking about socialization, you know. As a cop, as a male, 
what's your social, how have you been socialized to look at domestic violence when you show up to a house, right? Domestic violence, domestics are one of the most frequent calls, right? So what happens when you show up and the woman is, who t sometimes tends to be a woman, t it's, it, it's crying and sobbing, but, but a lot of times we used to go back into the, either the police department or whatnot, and, and what you hear is, uh, well, well, she'll be back in no time, right? Oh, they, they, they'll just get back, right? So then you just hand a pamphlet and hope that they'll eventually leave. But what happens is that they don't leave, and we don't know why they don't leave, because we don't even study them, right? So we get, we get caught up in this vicious cycle of, of, are we helping, are we not helping? I don't think so, um, but you don't really know how far you're not helping because you're not really getting into the nitty and gritty stuff, right? Police Academy, again, we never talked about these, these things. Um, as, uh, uh, the same thing with mental health. You never, ever talked about the impact that mental health has on criminal behavior, right? And some of the things that are missing is, we're not 100% sure, just because there's no courses, there are, there are professors and there are teachers that talk about these topics in the classroom, but we don't know to what extent, so, so that's, also, that's also missing. Um, but one thing I think that we have to ground ourselves in is what the number one answer that, that cops say um, in interviews about why you want to do this job is because I want to help people. It's such an answer that when we coach other people before they go into interviews that we tell them, don't say that. Right? It's, it's too much. It's, it's too general. Um, everybody says that. Don't say that. But it's interesting is that we want to help people, but we don't even know about the people we want to help. We don't know what makes them tick. We don't know why they're in the situation that they're in. We don't know how to get them out, right? And it's not because the answers are so complicated. It's because we haven't even taken the time to even listen. We haven't even taken the time to actually sit down and, 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 and listen to victims. Kids who see domestic violence are more likely to, to also um, continue the cycle of violence with their intimate partners, right? And, we have, and we've never really got into the nitty and the gritty of what exactly is happening to, um, to these kids during, during those times, right? And my, my suggestion is the sooner we get on the ground and understand these issues, um, it could serve as a catalyst for, for criminal justice on preventing um, this from going on. Um, so, if I leave you with anything is, when you say you want to help people, you ask yourself, are you really, do you really know about the person that you're helping? Thank you.